let's begin with our uh, quantum field theory lecture. Oh, some more participants, very good. So yesterday we ended up uh, with calculating the photon vacuum polarization in quantum electrodynamics and we went through a sequence of calculational tricks which are maybe uh, mostly unfamiliar to you and so we did it very quickly. We uh, had the idea of dimensional regularization where integrals are defined in d dimensions. We derived the so-called master formula for one loop integrals. We derived the formula for the B0 function with certain simple arguments and uh, for the photon vacuum polarization I showed you two very general tricks, Feynman parametrization and integration by parts. And combining all of those methods, we arrived at this extremely simple formula for the photon vacuum polarization. And now we want to discuss what it means. First of all, we will analyze the formula itself by looking at some limits in order to get some insight what the formula actually tells us and then we will do physics interpretation of the photon vacuum polarization. So let us begin with studying some limits. And in order to evaluate the limits, let's first look at some integrals. For example, uh, the combination which appears here a few times in the formula is this integral from 0 to 1 dx, x minus x squared. And so uh, we need to e integrate polynomials. Uh, x squared from 0 to 1 gives, gives 1 half. Uh, sorry, x integrated from 0 to 1 gives 1 half, x squared gives minus 1 third, and so the overall result is 1 over 6. And uh, then what we also need is the B0 function. Uh, that was evaluated to this divergent combination capital delta plus a logarithm integrated over 0 to 1 logarithm of mu squared divided by q integrated over x. And q is an abbreviation for a polynomial in x which also depends on the physical variables m squared and q squared. Okay, so then we have enough so that we can compute our photon vacuum polarization and I will write down the results for the combination A gamma where we have factored out the coupling constants so to extract really the functional dependence on the mass and the momentum. So let us first look at the divergent part. The divergent part of this A gamma comes from plugging in the divergent part into the B0 function and the finite part comes from taking the finite part of the B0 function. So first the divergent part a gamma divergent of Q square is what? So then we have the 1 over 16 pi square times 8 times the integral over the combination here times the divergent part of B0 which is just delta. So delta is just one factor and all the prefactors come from 8 divided by 16 divided by 6 gives 1 over 12. 1 over 12 pi square times delta. That is the result and interestingly the result um, is independent of the momentum q square. So what is really noteworthy is the result here is a momentum independent constant. We will come back to this inside the divergence is not depending on the momentum. Then let us look at the finite part. And as a first example, let us evaluate the finite part for the specific momentum zero, Q square equals zero in the argument. What happens if we evaluate uh, the B zero function at Q square equals zero? If small Q square is zero, the big Q is just M square. Big Q is just m squared, so here we have mu squared divided by m squared. That doesn't depend on x, 
So the integral from 0 to 1 gives just the argument. So we get ln mu squared over m squared. So we have ln mu squared over m squared times the same prefactor. So we get 1 over 12 pi squared times ln mu squared over m squared. So that is just a constant. This is the finite part at zero momentum, and it's some constant, which depends on the mass and which depends on this unphysical mass scale mu. Then we can, for all the other q square, let us use again another split. Let's write the finite part for an arbitrary q square as the finite part at zero plus a rest. Okay, let's split off the zero contribution plus a rest, and the rest I call here a hat gamma finite of q square. So a hat of q square is just uh, the original a minus a at zero. And maybe to make it even more explicit, let me write down the full a gamma. The full a gamma of q square is now the following. It's first of all the divergent part, divergent part, uh, which is a momentum independent constant, as we saw, plus the finite part at zero, plus the a hat finite at q square. So this is now the way how we split our a gamma into three contributions, divergent, finite at zero and a rest. And the rest is uh, then, of course, the interesting thing which gives us the physical dependence on Q square. So, therefore, let us evaluate um, this finite remainder, a hat finite of Q square. This is now the following. So the prefactor is uh, 1 over 2 pi square times the following integral. 1 over 2 pi square times the following integral from 0 to 1 dx. And the integrand is x minus x square times now the part from the b0 function where we put in the full capital Q. But we have subtracted away this part here. So subtracting off that logarithm from this logarithm means nothing else but replacing the mu square by m square. So the difference between the two logs, uh, the ln mu square cancels, and you get an ln m square in the numerator. So therefore, we have here the following integrand, ln m square divided by m square minus q square times x minus x square. And that now really extracts the physical part the interesting part of the vacuum polarization as an explicit integral. That is still a non-trivial integral, but it's also not too complicated and if it can be evaluated. Ah, that's right. Yeah, uh, that relative sign is definitely correct. I don't know what we had yesterday, but I'm absolutely sure that this sign is correct. That was your second remark. So what you can memorize and what I know is that the relative sign between the divergence delta and the ln mu square is always positive. So uh, you can see this from the derivation that uh, actually we started with mu square to the power epsilon times gamma of epsilon. So this combination is what always appears in, uh, from the structure of dimensional regularization. And therefore, if this is replaced by 1 over epsilon, you inevitably get 1 over epsilon plus ln mu square. So this relative sign is completely fixed right from the beginning. Therefore, the sign is definitely correct. <coughs> 
and it is also something that you can memorize. It's so often important to see that com uh, correlation. Okay, but here we now have an explicit formula for uh, the finite remainder, which is a complicated function of Q square, but we can now evaluate it. We, we can, of course, evaluate the integral analytically using some mathematics, but let's not uh, do that. Let's uh, look at some special cases which are physically interesting. One interesting case is the limit Q square going to zero where we can do a Taylor expansion in Q square. If we have small Q square, then the logarithm here in the integral can be first of all written as ln one divided by one minus Q square over M square times X minus X square. Okay, th this is still exact. But then uh, Q square over M square is regarded as a very small quantity and we do a Taylor expansion in this small quantity. Uh, it is uh, differentiable at q square equals zero. There is no singularity at all, so Taylor expansion works completely fine. And the Taylor expansion of logarithm of one plus x is simply x. So therefore we get here simply q square over m square times x minus x square. That's simply the first order Taylor expansion. And then we can plug in this Taylor expanded log into the integral and then the integral becomes just an integral over a polynomial in X instead of a combination of polynomial and log. So then we get the following integral. Just looking at the integral only, we get X minus X square from here and another X minus X square from there. So we get X minus X square squared, which is the integral of x square minus 2x cubed plus x to the fourth. Okay. So this integral can of course be evaluated. The integral of x square is 1 over 3. Integral of x cubed is minus 2 over 4. And x to the 4 gives 1 over 5. So then you have to add those numbers. So the common denominator is 30. So here you have 10 over 30 minus 15 over 30 plus 6 over 30 gives overall 1 over 30. Then plugging that uh, in completely, then we have evaluated the integral over the log. We have in addition the prefactor q square over m square and that here. So therefore we have a gamma hat finite of very small q square is approximately 1 over 6t pi square times q square over m square. And what we have neglected is terms of the order q to the 4. So we have done a Taylor expansion around q square equals 0. So the result is Taylor expandable and uh, the first order looks like that. So that is nice. And we will use it uh, for physics discussions later on. Then a last limit, Q square going to infinity. Let's look at the magnitude of Q square going to infinity. So we can have both positive Q square or negative Q square because it's a Minkowski four momentum, which could be a T channel in a Feynman diagram or an S channel in a Feynman diagram. So let's look at uh, both cases and then what we do in the log is simply we neglect the mass entirely. So this mass is neglected entirely. And then the log becomes approximately ln m square over minus q square uh, plus the log of 1 over x minus x square. So a log of a product gives the sum of the individual logs, right? And so I separated off the log here, which is x dependent, and the log which is non x dependent. And I've neglected the mass entirely. Therefore, that becomes a product. So here we have a dimensionless physics ratio, and here we have a dimensionless ratio just from numbers, which is easy to integrate. But actually, we don't even care about it because that is interesting because it's logarithmically enhanced. So for very large momenta, this goes to infinity. 
and becomes dominant, whereas that is not depending on the physics variables. It's independent of Q squared, therefore that remains a constant. And so for very large Q squared, we need to take into account only that, and we will neglect everything else. Therefore, for very large Q squared, the log is approximately just given by this, and then we get the prefactor that we already know from the integral, which is one over six times that. And so therefore, we can write approximately Q square going to infinity is approximately 1 over 12 pi square times logarithm of m square divided by minus Q square. And what we have neglected are non-log enhanced terms. So here at infinity, the result has no Taylor expansion. Uh, but it's logarithmically divergent, and that is also interesting for the physics interpretation later on. So, and I want to highlight this once more, and we will discuss it uh, in more detail later. But this is a typical behavior, and therefore I wanted to look at all these limits as opposed to doing an exact calculation, but the limits give you some insight. It is very typical that at low energies you can do a Taylor expansion of such results, whereas at high energies you typically get a logarithmic enhancement, which is really a new effect from the quantum theory and from the higher order effects, because at three level you see that looking at the Feynman diagrams there is absolutely no way you could get a logarithmic energy dependence, but due to those higher orders you get such dependencies, and so this is one of the new quantum effects. So let us then look at the interpretation of all of this. That is section 5.3, the physics of the photon vacuum polarization. All right, let us start uh, with the QED three level predictions. Ah, sorry, uh, headline 531. Let's first look at some observables. So 531 is observables. And let us, uh, in order to define observables in a simple way, look at some three level um, processes, for example here Compton scattering or E plus E minus, two mu plus mu minus, and so on. Different angles, different energies, and of course there could be more processes. But if you predict these processes at three level, you will always find the result of the following structure. Namely, we always get some cross-section d sigma by d omega, which is proportional to alpha divided by some momentum q square from these internal propagators. And uh, so that would be the Feynman diagram, and uh, the Feynman diagram is squared. So we get something like alpha over some momentum squared, overall squared, times some other function of the energy and angles and so on. Okay, so this is always the structure where alpha is given by the coupling constant E square over 4 pi, and I just write alpha because this is a common abbreviation for this combination here. Okay, so all these three level processes will have a formula that looks like this. And now what we can do is we can define something that we can call pseudo-observables, which are not directly real observables in experiment, but it's 
of often possible for experimentalists to translate their findings into such pseudo-observables which are easy to compare to theory. And so for our lecture purposes, that would be a very good thing to look at. So in experiments, we can define something like a pseudo-observable. And of course, uh, not all observables will be brought into that form, but just for pedagogical purposes, let's look at such observables where we can write that the experimentally observed cross-section, the sigma by the omega, which directly comes from data, let's say experiment i, we have many experiments uh, labeled by an index i, they can be mapped to the three-level QED prediction by definition. So you just basically uh, divide your experimental result, divided by the three-level QED prediction. And uh, you see that QED prediction depends on alpha square. And then you can define what we call an effective alpha for the experiment I. So what that means is that you take the three-level formula and you replace the theory alpha by some new quantity. And that new quantity uh, defines your measurement. Right? You can always write your measurement in the form of three-level prediction with some value of alpha. For some value of alpha, the three-level prediction matches your measurement. And uh, therefore, by construction, you can call that alpha the observable from your experiment. And so then you have a very simple way to communicate your result and uh, compare the uh, results of different experiments and also compare with theory. And of course, that is a, a more theoretical way to look at experiments, but it's very useful for our lecture. So every experimental result could be communicated by um, in this way by defining an effective alpha. And so then let's say each observable defines an effective alpha effective for experiment i. And uh, what we have learned from before, the QED three-level prediction QED three-level prediction exists. And uh, the QED three-level prediction would, of course, be by construction that all of those effective alphas are predicted to be the theory alpha. That is the construction recipe. So for each uh, experiment, the QED prediction would be the same. At three level, you predict that the effective alpha is equal to the theory alpha. And in particular, the QED three-level prediction is that all of those experimentally measured effective alphas are all the same. That is simply by construction. In order, basically, to bring all the experiments onto an equal footing and to make it easy to analyze from the theory point of view what now happens at higher orders. Because at higher orders, QED does not predict that all the effective alphas will be the same. But at higher orders, QED will predict something more complicated. And that is, however, now very easy to compare and analyze. So what we get in QED at higher orders is the following. So in QED at higher orders, we will have new Feynman diagrams. And in particular, we have done the approximation where the only higher order Feynman diagrams are in the photon vacuum polarization. So therefore, such processes will get a correction from the photon vacuum polarization. And so then, basically, what happens is that instead of E squared divided by Q squared at three level, we now have E squared divided by Q squared times 1 plus pi gamma of Q squared. 
that is the new prediction, right? That is what we have seen. And so here I put the version of the one loop correction with this resummed vacuum polarization, which uh, went into the denominator because we have summed a geometric series. One could also write in the numerator times one minus pi gamma. At the one loop level, it's the same. Okay, so that is the prediction. And now, uh, comparing this to our experimental definition of the effective alphas, it seems to simply means that at higher orders, QED, in our approximation, predicts now the following, namely the effective alpha of experiment I, which works at some particular Q square, is now given by, instead of this, by this expression, and the difference is the factor in the denominator 1 plus pi gamma. So we have E square divided by 4 pi divided by 1 plus pi gamma of Q square, where the Q square is the Q square which is relevant for the experiment number i. That is the prediction at higher orders. And so you see that at higher orders, QED does not anymore predict that all the effective alphas would be the same. But each experiment gets a higher order correction in the predicted uh, version. And this higher order correction depends on the vacuum polarization, where we insert the momentum, which is relevant for the process that we consider. And so therefore, we can then basically come back to our sketch that we had yesterday. So we have this parameter in QED E. And as a function of this parameter, we calculate predictions for all interesting observables. So for example, we predict here the observable E plus E minus at low energies. That would be observable one. And then we might get alpha effective uh, in the Thomson limit uh, would be predicted to be e square over 4 pi divided by 1 plus uh, e square times this a gamma of, sorry, it's a little bit uh, not enough space, e square times a gamma of 0, right? So Thomson limit uh, for some scattering processes works at 0 momentum. That was the definition of Thomson limit. And uh, therefore, we get evaluated the photon vacuum polarization at zero momentum. So and then we can write this as an effective alpha in the Thomson limit is given by that combination. Then another experiment at high energies, let's say alpha effective high energy would be given by e square over 4 pi divided by 1 plus e square a gamma of q square at some pi value, and so on. OK, so you can now write down many, many observables like this. And you see the structure from yesterday has emerged. We have one input parameter, e. And as a function of that, we can predict infinitely many observables. I wrote down two here, encapsulated in terms of this effective alpha, where the formulas are very, very simple and transparent, hopefully. And so now we can discuss, on the one hand, the so-called renormalization scheme, where the divergences drop out. And we will see how they drop out and why they universally drop out for all observables simultaneously, because that was a non-trivial hope from yesterday. And we will see that it is fulfilled. And the next thing is that we will actually discuss the physics uh, in, in, in uh, implications, uh, because we see here already something interesting happens both at low energies and at high energies. And therefore, there will be interesting predictions from the uh, QED higher orders for low energy and for high energy processes. So our next section is indeed renormalization. And we will explain renormalization with the help of this particular example here. And that is quite sufficient to show you the general principles in line with our ideas that we developed yesterday. <laughs>
So the general procedure of renormalization in practice can be basically divided into five steps that you need to take. And uh, of course here it's a little bit overkill probably, but I will nevertheless go through all of these five steps which can be applied in the same way also for very complicated cases like the electroweak standard model where all the steps are very involved, but the steps are the same. And so uh, therefore let me do it. Here most steps are actually trivial. So step one. Step one is the so-called renormalization transformation. We have now uh, seen and established that our parameter E is not an observable but it is a formal theory parameter as a function of which we can compute observables, but the relationship between E and observables might actually be divergent. And so E itself is unphysical. And we have already introduced the name bare quantities for such unphysical objects. And so let us now make this more explicit by relabeling it. So the E so far will now be called really E bare with an index bare to make explicit that we are talking about the bare uh, charge. And uh, what we mean by this is it may depend on epsilon and it might be divergent. So and then we do what we call renormalization transformation, this uh, bare charge and I repeat this is the E that we had so far. This is now called as follows. We split it into a sum like that and uh, let's give some explicit indices E renormalized plus delta E. So the bare coupling constant is split into a renormalized coupling constant plus a so-called renormalization constant such that uh, this object here remains finite in the limit epsilon going to zero and all the divergences are contained in the delta E. That is of course something that we can do uh, if we have such a formula. Nothing can stop us from doing it. Let me also uh, give a second formula which is uh, then more useful in practice. We can do the same for E square, which is the square of the line before, which is E square renormalized plus two E renormalized times delta E. And let's ignore the delta E square. Let's just say plus higher orders, because what we will also assume in this split is that the delta E is of higher orders. All the divergences arise at the one loop level, so they are of higher order compared to tree level. And so therefore we assume that this delta E is of higher order in the perturbation theory than this. And uh, therefore delta E square would be of even higher order and we neglect it for today. So let me write here some remarks. So as we discussed, this is by definition by we require it to be finite and epsilon independent. And this will be the new expansion parameter of our perturbation theory. So in a way we reshuffle our perturbation theory before we might have said we do a perturbative power series expansion in this bare coupling constant and from now on we will say we do a perturbative um, power series expansion in the renormalized coupling and that here is of higher order. And the name of this delta E is so called renormalization constant. The name constant is a misnomer because it depends on epsilon but of course it doesn't depend on momentum and so on. So it depends on epsilon and uh, is a power series 
in the renormalized charge, E renormalized, of order, uh, higher order than at least E square. Actually, uh, yeah. it's even of higher order, it starts at E cube, uh, because the vacuum polarization is of order E square. So we split this, and this kind of split is called a renormalization transformation. And in general, you would do that for all parameters in your theory, and here we just consider only one. After doing that, we are at step two. So we do now a renormalized perturbation theory. So we expand in this renormalized coupling constant E up to one loop order, and one loop order for us means up to E renormalized to the fourth power. So for example, for this alpha effective, for all these different experiments, alpha effective I uh, was originally E square divided by Q square plus pi gamma. Okay, and uh, pi gamma is proportional to E square itself. Therefore, if we expand that now up to um, uh, this order, we get E renormalized square divided by four pi. And uh, then we have this E square goes to E square plus um, two E renormalized, so plus uh, times one plus uh, 2e renormalized times delta e from the e square, which has uh, undergone that replacement. And then uh, we get from the denominator minus e renormalized square a gamma of q square for the experiment i. Okay. So I have now brought that back into the numerator and replaced pi gamma by e square times a gamma. e square is replaced by e bare square. e bare is then power expanded in the renormalized charge and terms of order e to the four uh, are taken into account and higher order terms are neglected. So this delta e is of at least of order um, e square. Therefore, that term here is of the order e to the fourth power. Uh, sorry, what has happened here? Uh, ah, divided by E renormalized. Sorry, because I fact, uh, E square becomes E square plus two times E delta E. If I factor out E square, then I get that. So that is the same as here divided by E square. So, but this is at least of order uh, E to the third. And uh, that is of the order overall E to the fourth. And if I would plug in here also a delta E, then it would be of higher order than E to the fourth, and so it's negligible. So up to that order, this is exactly the full expression that we have. So, and in general, you would do that for all quantities that you are interested in, and so here we have done that already. Then, step three, you would choose now a concrete scheme for this delta E and for the renormalized E, and that is called renormalization scheme. We choose a renormalization scheme. That is a very crucial step in the procedure of renormalization in practice. So I told you that we uh, know clearly that we can split our bare charge into that way. But how do we split exactly into a finite part and a divergent part? That is not unique because you can change the divergent part by a finite amount and it remains divergent and the finite part remains finite. So there is of course an ambiguity here. And fixing that ambiguity amounts to choosing what we call a renormalization scheme. So let me write this in a few different ways, all of which are useful. So it Choosing the renormalization scheme is equivalent to choosing the split between 
i renormalized plus delta e. That is also equivalent to saying that you write down a definition of what you mean by delta e as a function of the renormalized e. That is also equivalent to something else, namely once you have defined this, you plug in the definition into uh, this relationship here between, uh, that is now the relationship between your theory input parameter and an observable, right? And so if you plug in some particular choice for the delta E, then you will get a particular version of this formula. If you make a different choice, the formula will look different. So what the definition amounts to is it gives a specific version of the relationship between observables and the theory parameters. Changing the theory parameters changes the formulas. So it gives a specific relationship between observables and input parameters. Here, E renormalized. If you know what is the relationship between your observables and your renormalized charge, it means you can basically do a measurement and then determine the numerical value of your renormalized charge from the experimental measurement. So it determines the numerical value of the renormalized charge and also the physical meaning of what you mean by your renormalized charge. Your physical meaning and numerical value of E renormalized. All of that is equivalent and all of that is important in understanding and using such renormalization schemes. And this is the reason why in the literature you find different numerical values for quantities like alpha or other quantities like the W boson mass or a top quark mass and so on, because you can define those quantities according to different renormalization schemes. And if somebody sees a different value for alpha, then it is not a mistake, but it corresponds to a different renormalization scheme, in other words, to a different definition of alpha. Here we will now make a particular choice. We will uh, restrict ourselves to one renormalization scheme which is very physical and very nice to interpret which is the so-called on-shell renormalization scheme or on-shell scheme. It's a very famous and very often used scheme, but it's not the only one. And uh, this is defined as follows, namely at Q0 square, so therefore on shell, like the photon mass is zero, so Q square equals zero corresponds to the on shell relation for the photon mass. Let us require that at this uh, momentum, we require that the alpha effective uh, at Q square equals zero is just given by the three level relationship E square renormalized divided by four pi. That is our requirement. And uh, then we call E renormalized in that scheme is called EOS for on shell scheme. So that is now the name that we will use so EOS stands for the renormalized charge according to that specific uh, chosen on-shell renormalization scheme. So it's basically a physical requirement. You require that the renormalized charge basically means the charge that you measure in very low energy experiments like in this Thomson limit experiment. 
So therefore, for such low energy observables, what that all means is that uh, the prediction of the theory also at higher orders uh, is equal to the tree level prediction. And then it means that the effective alpha measured in such experiments is equal to the theory alpha with no corrections. So step four, that will now become manifest. So we solve for the renormalization constant. So we have imposed a renormalization condition uh, which fixes our split delta E and E renormalized, but the condition is formulated as a relationship for the renormalized charge. And now we have to solve what does that relationship imply for the delta E. What does it imply? So in the on-shell scheme, uh, it means uh, we have to look at step two. In step two, we have written down our general observable uh, given in terms of uh, the delta E. When we now require that for Q square equals zero, uh, all the loop corrections vanish, then it means that the terms in the round bracket, two times delta E over E, uh, minus the other thing, that must be zero for Q square equals zero. And then we have our condition for delta E, namely uh, two uh, delta E divided by E on shell must be equal to E on shell square times A gamma of zero. And then we have an explicit formula for our renormalization constant. And this formula is obviously specific to the chosen renormalization scheme. Step five. Now we can compute everything. We can compute all quantities that we are interested in. Compute all other quantities. And we, in perturbation theory, we go up to order E renormalized, in other words, E on shell to the fourth power. So, and then we can plug in our renormalization condition into step two. In step two, we have our formula, but there we had just a simple delta E. Now we know what our simple delta E actually is. Namely, it is a gamma at zero. So we can plug it over there, and then we get the difference of a gamma at Q square minus a gamma at zero. And that was what we called a hat. That was the interesting Q square dependent part of the a gamma, the a hat. That is exactly what remains here now in the prediction. So therefore, our step two formula becomes alpha effective for experiment i is given by e now e on shell square divided by 4 pi times 1 minus e on shell square times uh, a hat gamma finite of q square for the experiment i. And just to remind you, that is the difference of the actual a gamma of Q square minus A gamma at zero. And the A gamma of zero enters because of our renormalization condition. What has now happened? What has happened is that for all observables, simultaneously, the divergences have dropped out. These relationships are infinitely many predictions for infinitely many different observables as a function of the renormalized charge. And all of those infinitely many formulas are all finite. There are no one over epsilons anymore. This a hat is a finite formula which we have discussed. It is. Uh, um, consists of normal mathematical objects like logarithms and power series expansions in Q square. Therefore, we have absolutely explicit, well-defined expressions in the limit epsilon going to zero. So 
uh, all predicted observables are finite. Epsilon going to zero is possible. So at this point, we can remove our regularization and take that limit, and that is what we now do. So we have established the finiteness for all observables. And uh, just to remind you, that is the case for by construction for the first one. So the first observable was the one in this Thomson limit where Q square was zero. And our renormalization condition is constructed such that the Thomson limit observable is automatically finite because there we made our delta E cancel the divergence. The delta E canceled everything, including the divergence. So therefore, this is by construction finite. But for all the other infinitely many observables, it's a non-trivial fact that the finiteness emerges simultaneously. And that is what we discussed yesterday. Uh, yesterday we discussed that we can only hope that it will cancel for all observables, and now we see that it does. So, and as I told you also, higher orders is not only about technical stuff like canceling divergences, they have now canceled, but now uh, the door is open towards physics discussions because these formulas contain very interesting and non-trivial predictions for physics which depend on Q square and which uh, depend on the observable. And so therefore we get now many non-trivial physics predictions. And that is what we want to discuss today as well. Let me just uh, give you a few more comments on renormalization before we actually start discussing physics. What I want to point out is this detail which we have already remarked, which is now important. So why does the whole thing actually work? The point is that the divergence in this vacuum polarization pi gamma of Q square, it turned out to be a momentum independent constant. So the divergence delta was not uh, depending on any Q square. And uh, that is the reason that for all observables, for all Q squared, the divergence drops out simultaneously. And let's make that a little bit more explicit. So something which is momentum independent in momentum space, what does that mean in position space or in X space? You go uh, by Fourier transformation from momentum space to X space. And so basically, what is the Fourier transformation of a constant? It is a delta function of X. So Fourier transformation of a constant means something local in position space. So that is like a local interaction, which can be written as a term in the Lagrangian. And also as a Feynman rule. Let's make that explicit. Our Lagrangian, which initially depends on this bare charge, E bare, can now be written as a Lagrangian, which depends on the renormalized charge plus delta E. Let's plug in uh, this distribution, this split into the Lagrangian. Then we get our Lagrangian, which first of all only depends on the renormalized charge. And then the uh, only place where the charge appears is, of course, this interaction term, which looks like this, psi bar, gamma mu, 
psi times a mu, right, this term. And initially, the term appeared with a prefactor um, minus e times q. And so if you do that replacement, then you get once the same term just proportional to the renormalized charge and once proportional to minus delta e times the same thing. So that is then the Lagrangian. And I write it here explicitly. The uh, original Lagrangian with a bare charge is given by the same thing where we have the renormalized charge plus this extra term proportional to delta e. And this term uh, gives a Feynman rule. The Feynman rule looks like this. It has is the same Feynman rule as we always had, but uh, by convention, such Feynman rules with renormalization constants, they are called counterterm Feynman rules, and they are signified with such a cross here. So anyway, that gives this Feynman rule, and the value of the Feynman rule is minus i delta e times q times gamma mu. So it's the same as the normal Feynman rule, but with delta e instead of e. And that is a local interaction. Now what happens if I use that Feynman rule in the calculation of processes, then I get uh, this Feynman diagram that we have computed with the photon vacuum polarization. But I also get now this Feynman diagram here with uh, the counter term Feynman rule at one vertex plus the other Feynman diagram where the counter term is at the other vertex. Or I also would get this Feynman diagram with counter terms at both vertices, but they are of higher order and can be neglected. So we need to consider these three Feynman diagrams. They are all of the same order in perturbation theory because the delta E alone is of the same order as this loop. Therefore, these three diagrams are exactly uh, diagrams of the same perturbative order. And what happens if I add them up? I get exactly this combination that we had, namely two times delta E times the usual Feynman diagram. And that gives the three-level Feynman diagram times the vacuum polarization. So combination, we can write this as the three-level Feynman diagram times the following correction. So from here, we get the correction factor uh, uh, so let's start here. We get uh, two times delta E over E renormalized as a correction factor because that is just the same as three level times that correction. And here we get, let's get the signs correct, we get minus A hat uh, gamma of Q square uh, times E renormalized square. And then you see that is the correction that we get. The A gamma has a divergent part, but the divergence does not depend on Q square. Therefore, the divergence can be cancelled by this constant uh, coming from the new counterterm Feynman rule delta E over E. And so this is the explanation why this procedure of uh, the renormalization transformation, cancelling the divergences, why it works. Namely, it works because the original divergences correspond to local interactions, which can be written in terms of Lagrangian terms. And that is the general thing, right? Everything we have done here is, of course, an example. And the general lesson, which is absolutely true in all relativistic quantum field theories, is that indeed, the divergences that you encounter at some loop order correspond to such local interactions which can be written as a term in the Lagrangian and which can be cancelled by introducing such counterterm Feynman rules and such counterterm Lagrangians. And then uh, usually the counterterm Lagrangian and the rest can be combined to such a bare Lagrangian. So let me just write this in general. All quantum field theory divergences can be cancelled in this way. <laughs>
And of course, I refer you again if you are interested in more details to uh, the lecture 8 to 12 from 2019. Or to the multi loop lecture uh, if you want even more details. But for us, this is sufficient because we have established the general principle and you see that it works and how it works. And this is completely generalizable to much more complicated cases. Do you have questions? Yes. That corresponds to one loop. One loop brings in two additional powers of the charge and therefore one loop diagrams that we consider are of fourth order in the charge. And therefore we do everything consistently up to that order. So that is not something general, but we do it here. Yeah, 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 right. I mean two loop would correspond to e to the six. And if you have a more complicated process with many more particles, then uh, three level would correspond to whatever e to the four and one loop to e to the six and so on. So this is adapted to our case. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't seem very obvious. No, it doesn't seem obvious. But there is a deep physical reason behind it. And uh, the deep physical reason is that the divergences come from the fact that the uh, integrals, the loop integrals, go to k equal infinity. And the divergences come from the region where the loop momentum is infinitely large. So they come from regions uh, where we have extremely high energies corresponding to very, very small distances. So the divergences arise from the region in space time where uh, particles or vertices in Feynman diagram are infinitely close to each other. And that is the reason that they can be cancelled by local terms in the Lagrangian. And in momentum space, it's not always a constant, but what always happens is the divergences are polynomials in the momenta of low orders of certain orders which you can calculate beforehand and so in this case of the vacuum polarization it would have been clear from the beginning that the divergence must be a polynomial of zeroth order in uh, the momentum but in general because the divergences arise from infinitely high energies and very small distances in position space they can always be cancelled by such local terms in the Lagrangian. So that is as a matter of principle the intuition which is behind it and uh, of course establishing this as a mathematical theorem is far from trivial but the physical reason is really this they come from high momentum behavior in the loop and therefore um, correspondingly to very small distance behavior right on. It is also interesting to compare to what we actually know from experiment because of course our quantum field theory, relativistic quantum field theory with local Lagrangians and so on is an idealization. We have not experimentally uh, checked what happens at infinitely high energies. Accessible to us are finite energies, very large energies maybe, but not infinite energies. And according to distance scale, we have probed nature at distances up to 10 to the minus 18 meters and so on, or 10 to the minus 20 meters maybe. But we have not probed nature at infinitely small distances. So we do not really know whether nature should be described by an absolutely local relativistic theory up to infinitely small distances or whether maybe uh, the theory is like that up to 10 to the minus 20 meters but uh, for smaller distances the physics changes a lot. What this renormalization tells us is that actually uh, physics that we can observe, physics that uh, is experimentally accessible in observables like the ones we have considered which are defined at at least not infinite energies but at certain energy ranges low up to a certain maximum energy, 
those observables are actually insensitive to the physics that goes on at infinitely high energies. Because the regularization and the renormalization procedure basically changes our theory at very, very small distances. And the fact that the limit epsilon going to zero exists means that our observables are actually not depending on the details of how we modify our theory at very, very small distances. And that is very nice because it tells us that uh, this insensitivity uh, also means that we do not need actually to do experiments at arbitrarily high energies in order to test our theories or to set up our theories. Our theories can be happily defined at uh, certain energy ranges up to the energy scale that we can probe experimentally. And uh, all the higher energies, they are contained in the theory, but actually our predictions are insensitive to those details. This is also a lesson from this renormalization theory that we have this kind of insensitivity of low energy observables to high energy details of the theory. And I mean, actually you might ask yourself, maybe uh, true nature is described by epsilon equal 0 0.1. If it were, we would not know because the limit epsilon going to zero exists. That means our predictions uh, would actually be more or less the same because of the limit if epsilon is zero or 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 and so on. Because I mean, the fact that the limit exists means that uh, to a good approximation, everything is independent of epsilon as long as epsilon is small enough. So it tells you that uh, the theory could be changed at high energies without um, us being able to notice. Of course, what I just said ignores the fact that for epsilon going uh, non-zero, we have unphysical things in our theory like uh, the equal 4.1 dimensions. What that means is not so clear, but in principle, I think you get the idea. And so therefore, there is a quite physical interpretation of the fact that quantum field theory is renormalizable. It has this connection. And we will actually come back to a more physical way of looking at what I've just explained in about 20 minutes. I hope we have enough time today. Otherwise, we will go on on Thursday. So let us discuss the physics implications and let us indeed begin by physics at low energies where what I just explained um, plays a role. Let us first look at Q square exactly zero which is the classical limit or the limit of this Thomson scattering. And what we have achieved by our renormalization scheme is simply the fact that uh, an effective uh, alpha at the Thomson limit, which means Q equals zero, is now predicted to be equal to the on-shell scheme E square divided by four pi, because that was our construction renormalization condition. This equality is a definition. And uh, so it simply means that uh, if an experimentalist measures now scattering at these lower energies and translates this into an alpha, then our on-shell charge is directly equal to that measured alpha. and so. This means that uh, our E on shell really means physically the charge measured in low energy experiments or in experiments where classical electrodynamics is applicable. 
and so this alpha in the Thomson limit or alpha in the on-shell scheme or E on-shell square divided by 4 pi. That is this famous 1 over 137 point something. So in, you can do extremely precise experiments, of course, in this low energy context. So this alpha here is known to 10 digit accuracy. And therefore, this on-shell scheme renormalized charge is also known to 10 digit accuracy. Therefore, it's a very, very good and very solid starting point for higher order predictions in QED. Now, let us look at the next level. If Q square is only small, but not quite zero, such that we take into account the next order correction in a Taylor expansion. So as we said, this blob here can be Taylor expanded in Q square. And for small Q square, let us take into account the next order, but only the next order. Then what we get here is this E on shell square divided by 4 pi times now 1 minus our A hat of gamma, right? Because in the on-shell scheme, all that remains is the A hat, this finite remainder of our vacuum polarization. And we have calculated this A hat in the first Taylor expansion. And that was this 1 over 60. So we get here E on-shell square divided by 60 pi square times Q square over M square. That is now our approximation. What does that mean? That means something very physical, and I really want you to um, acknowledge this physical interpretation of that result. Actually, let me also uh, write here into the numerator, uh, denominator, 1 over Q square. So this is the essential point here of this Feynman diagram. So the 1 over Q square comes from the photon propagator. So far we have ignored it. But let us now look not only at these effective alphas in this case, but let us in this case look at the full behavior of the interaction. So the important part of the Feynman diagram is the interaction between the two fermion lines. And the interaction comes from, first of all, the couplings, but then the 1 over Q square from the photon propagator and that 1 over Q square now receives this correction. So let us discuss it. And uh, this result contains something that you all know from school, namely the Coulomb potential. Two electric charges attract or repel each other by the Coulomb interaction 1 over R square, or the potential is 1 over R. And this 1 over r is contained in the 1 over q square here. 1 over q square is momentum space. 1 over r is position space. But that is the same. So this is really the Coulomb potential here. And that is obviously a correction to the Coulomb potential. That means our QED at one loop order predicts that the Q, uh, QED potential is not 1 over r, but it is different from 1 over r. So let us calculate really the change to the Coulomb potential predicted by QED. And in order to do that, let's really write it as an actual potential in the sense of school physics. Um, you need to know how potentials are related to such momentum space, quantum mechanical amplitudes. And that relationship is done in quantum mechanics too, where we did scattering theory. And if you start with a classical potential V of x, the scattering amplitude is the Fourier transformation of the potential, where the argument is the three vector Q of um, the three momentum change. And so what we need to do here in order to extract it is the following. Uh, namely, we can Fourier transform back to position space, but replace the four momentum by a three momentum. So this is a correction to the Coulomb potential. So such a static potential that you know from school or first semester physics corresponds to the Fourier transformation of the propagator at Q0 equals 0. 
So in the limit of low energies, where you really have charges, the energies of the charges do not really change, only the momentum changes, and therefore the photon doesn't carry away energy, but it only carries away momentum. So let's use the approximation Q0 is 0, and then the four momentum square becomes equal to minus the three momentum Q vector squared. And this is the quantity which appears in quantum mechanics. So then we have essentially the Fourier transformed potential uh, V tilde of Q um, is this. So this would effectively be the amplitude for the process happening. And we interpret the amplitude as the Fourier transformed potential. So that is now given like follows. E on shell square divided by Q vector square. So I, let's remove the four pi, they are not important now. E on shell square divided by minus Q square. And then, then in the bracket we get, or let's do it without bracket. So we have this minus the next term with E on shell to the fourth power divided by 60 pi square. And actually, times q square over q square drops out, just times 1 over m square. So that is now effectively our quantum mechanics 2 a Fourier transform potential, v tilde of q. It has this first term, which comes from the tree level, and uh, the second term, which comes from the one loop correction. And so we can Fourier transform back v of x. So the Fourier transformation of that has been done in quantum mechanics. And this gives 1 over r with the following sign, minus e on shell square divided by 4 pi magnitude of x. So this is literally the Fourier transform of each other. And here we get the Fourier transformation of that. That is a constant in momentum space. So the Fourier transformation is just a delta function with the following prefactor e on shell to the fourth divided by 60 pi square m square times a three-dimensional delta function of x. So here you have it. Here you really see the Coulomb potential emerging. And you now interpret that the Coulomb potential 1 over r is directly a reflection of the tree level photon propagator, which is 1 over q square. Whereas at higher orders, uh, the propagator is effectively modified, and we get here a delta function <coughs> correction to the Coulomb potential. The delta function is, of course, an approximate result, because we have approximated here our Fourier transformation for small q. For larger q, uh, this is not correct. And so therefore, we should not regard the delta function as an absolutely exact result. So here, small q means large wavelength. The large wavelength cannot really resolve all the fine details around the origin. So for the large wavelength, the corrections just look like a delta function. For smaller wavelengths, the correction will have a more complicated x dependence. But for large wavelengths, the correction just looks like a delta function, which basically simply means that somehow the potential gets stronger at the origin. At the origin, you increase the attractive force. That is what this means. So potential. at origin is strengthened. And this has, of course, a very famous application and consequence, namely the so-called lamp shift. Lamp shift is the following. If you have a hydrogen atom, there are two levels, the level 2p one half and 2s one half, where p and s mean the orbital angular momentum is either 0 or 1. And uh, so either from 
Schrödinger equation and quantum mechanics one, or from the Dirac equation and quantum mechanics two, regardless, those two levels are degenerate. So in quantum mechanics one, you know the levels only depend on one over n square for the hydrogen energy levels. One over m, n square, uh, which is two here, but uh, they do not depend on L. And that remains true also for the Dirac equation theory. If you calculate hydrogen with Dirac equation, still uh, the energy level does not depend on L. It only depends on N. So these two levels are degenerate according to Schrödinger or Dirac. But now QED loop corrections predict that the levels will not be degenerate because the potential at the origin is now modified. Which level is affected by the modification of the potential at the origin? Only one of the two levels is affected because the P state has a wave function which vanishes at the origin. Therefore, it doesn't feel that change the S wave is maximal at the origin and therefore it feels that modification. And so therefore it is clear that this loop correction will split the two levels and there will be a shift. And this is the lamp shift. Uh, only S state feels the above correction. And therefore, we get a level splitting. Let me just say, we calculated uh, one Feynman diagram. And this one Feynman diagram shows us that there will be such a level splitting. But it's not the only Feynman diagram. In order to quantitatively evaluate the level splitting, we need all Feynman diagrams. And the other diagrams contribute as well. So the number that you get from here is wrong. It's just not. Uh, complete, but we get a non-zero result and this is what we can understand. And as you might know, this lamp shift is extremely famous. It was one of the first applications of QED loop calculations and uh, um, it is now still one of the most accurate tests of QED predictions and comparisons with experiment. So this is one of those precision tests of QED. OK, so how much else can we do today? How much else can we do today? We only have three minutes left, uh, four, five minutes left. Um, Right, either we can start a new topic or we do more details of that topic. I would say probably since we had already the discussion of renormalization and low energy versus high energy, let me uh, continue with that point and give you the <coughs> following remark on so-called effective field theories, which is also a topic of quantum field theory two, as we discussed in the beginning. And on Thursday, I will then do about 20 minutes lecture to discuss the high energy limit. The high energy limit will give rise to so-called running couplings, renormalization group techniques. And so we want to see that as well. But now let us discuss low energies and see the emergence of so-called effective field theories. So basically, I use all these physics discussions here also to give you outlooks to important further topics. So let me give you the following remark on effective field theories. <coughs> 
And let me immediately drop from the sky the following Lagrangian. Let's say L interaction effective is equal to the following. Let's write here some coupling constant times the following 1 over m square times f uh, minus 1 over 4 f mu nu d'Alembert f mu nu. So what has happened here? Minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu, you know it. That is the kinetic term of the photon. Now I inserted the d'Alembert operator in addition. So uh, overall, uh, the dimensionality of this is that is uh, mass square, mass square, mass square. So this is uh, mass to the sixth power. It's a so-called dimension six operator. And it has four time derivatives. So you should not interpret this in terms of classical Lagrangian dynamics where fourth time derivatives are very awkward to deal with. But this is only to be used in our uh, expansion of Feynman diagrams and perturbation theory, where the Lagrangian with operators appears in the exponential, in the time ordered exponential. And there, this creates no problems. It creates a new Feynman rule with a prefactor C6, that is a coefficient. And uh, so the mass square in the denominator accounts for the correct dimensionality of the whole thing. So this gives rise to a new Feynman rule. How does the Feynman rule look like? Let's write it here with a box for this uh, Feynman rule. The Feynman rule contains simply two photons. It's a bilinear Feynman rule. There are only two field operators in this Lagrangian. Therefore, the Feynman rule corresponds to such a bilinear term with two photon lines attached to a vertex. And what is the Feynman rule? I times the coefficient of the two photon fields with indices mu nu. And the coefficient is C6 divided by m square times what? So we have lots of derivatives here. And uh, let's do it all by head, and, uh, or you can do it at home. So the d'Alembert, of course, gives us uh, the minus q square running into one of the photon fields. So here there flows a momentum q. So the d'Alembert operator gives us minus q square as a prefactor. Then the derivatives inside of that give us a transverse projector that simply reflects the gauge invariance of this f mu f mu. So if you work out the derivatives, you get q square g mu nu minus q mu q nu. This is this transverse projection operator that we have often encountered. And that is the Feynman rule. So the Feynman rule is a polynomial of fourth order in the momentum. And it is transverse. If you compare this to that here, that was basically the same. It was minus i times this transverse projection operator, uh, q squared g mu nu minus q mu q nu times the photon vacuum polarization. Right? And this photon vacuum polarization at low energies, um, so let's say plus uh, these counter terms, terms. So that is then the, is replaced by just this uh, e square on shell times a hat gamma finite of q square. And that again for low energies was replaced by q square divided by m square times 60 pi square. So at low energies, our vacuum polarization can be written like this. The Feynman rule from that new Lagrangian looks like that. That tells us that we can replace our vacuum polarization by the new Feynman rule, or in other words, the vacuum polarization has the form which can be interpreted as a new Feynman rule, where it's exactly the same, q squared times that thing times a prefactor 
So we can simply read off that that factor C6 here must now be E square divided by 6T pi square. So effectively, the vacuum polarization is equivalent to the above effective Lagrangian with the value C6 equal to E on shell square divided by 6T pi square. And that makes manifest what I said before. At low energies, uh, such new quantum effects, here in this case, a new effect from a loop diagram, can actually be absorbed or rewritten equivalently just as a new Lagrangian. And the new Lagrangian is again local because we are working at low energies and therefore compared to our low energies, the loop momenta are very large and therefore uh, this Feynman diagram effectively corresponds to a local interaction where these two vertices are effectively at the same space-time point. Therefore, that can be written as an approximation like this. So this is general. And so let me write down the moral of the story. Then we stop, so at low energies, new effects are often equivalent to new terms in the Lagrangian. And that is what is called effective field theory. And what the loop calculation simply does in that context is it gives us the value of the coefficient C6. And once the loop calculation has given us the value of the coefficient C6, we can completely forget about loops. And instead of loops, we just use that Lagrangian, which is a simple Lagrangian with a simple Feynman rule. And it will uh, give us the same physics as the physics of the vacuum polarization. So then the entire physics discussion possible using this effective theory Lagrangian. And in this context, it uh, becomes possible to easily, for example, calculate corrections to atomic levels, because then you simply have a new Lagrangian. You could convert it into a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, and then you can maybe do quantum mechanics one just where you have an effective new term of the Hamiltonian, which looks like this or which comes from that. And uh, that effective new term in your quantum mechanics one Hamiltonian uh, is known to give the same physical effect as the loop correction in QED. So that is, of course, a very powerful possibility. And uh, one can say much more to this, but this is maybe now an outlook to a topic which will be the content of next semester's lectures. Okay, so let us stop here and you with a lecture for about 20 minutes. It is less than one page, so that should not, not take more than 20 minutes. And uh, okay, uh, let us finish our semester on quantum field theory one with a remark on physics at high energies. So again, restricting ourselves to this kind of observables in QED, where we look at E plus E minus scattering, for example, and we only look at corrections from loop graphs involving the photon vacuum polarization. And let's, for example, look at very high values of the photon momentum Q square, for example, equal to the Z boson mass square, which is very high compared to QED energy scales, or even higher scales like the grand unification scale, or uh, we could also go to infinity and ask, how does the QED prediction behave for very high energies of the photon? <coughs> 
So then we are looking at these kinds of diagrams. That is our approximation that we only look at photon vacuum polarization corrections. And all of those can be absorbed or parameterized in terms of such an effective alpha. And the effective alpha is then given in our on-shell renormalization scheme as uh, e square over 4 pi in the on-shell scheme divided by 1 plus the loop correction. Uh, 1 plus e square divided by 12 pi square times the logarithm of m square divided by minus q square. Okay, And here I have inserted um, two things. First of all, I have inserted the on-shell renormalization scheme. In the on-shell renormalization scheme, our vacuum polarization is modified by that counter term delta e, which had a specific value and uh, it led to uh, replacing the mu square from the calculation by the electron mass square here. And, so, and the, the second thing I did is inserting the approximation for high energies where there was a logarithmically enhanced term proportional to log q square and I neglect all the other terms which are not enhanced by log q square. So log q square goes to infinity and uh, so let us neglect everything which doesn't go to infinity. Then this is our approximate result and therefore indeed the main feature is that we have a logarithmic increase. And as I already explained to you, this is a typical thing that at high energies in quantum field theory, the theory predicts such logarithmic increases in the energy scales of the problem. And here we see it, uh, it appears in the denominator of course, but uh, Anyway, it is a logarithmically increasing effect which corrects here the tree-level prediction. The tree-level prediction would be effectively a constant, but because of that higher order loop correction, um, the cross-section and uh, the effective interaction strength is not constant, but it depends on the energy in a logarithmically increasing way. So, and is the... Uh, effect of that logarithmic increase actually positive or negative. So does the effective interaction strength decrease or increase as the energy go, uh, gets higher and higher? So that is right, this is the effective interaction strength by which the two fermions here interact. The higher that value is, the higher the effective interaction strength is. So when Q square increases, we get here a negative uh, logarithmic term. The negative logarithmic term appears in the denominator. Therefore, overall, the whole thing increases if the energy Q square increases. So the effective interaction strength becomes stronger and stronger. Let's write it down. become stronger at high energies, which are of course equivalent to high momenta, high scattering momenta, and that is also equivalent to very small distances. So you probe smaller and smaller distances, basically the two fermions get closer and closer to each other, and by getting closer and closer, uh, they feel a stronger interaction than you would expect uh, from classical electrodynamics. So the interaction strength gets stronger as the typical 1 over R potential. So let's look at some numbers. So for example, if this minus Q square is equal to the Z boson mass square, then I wrote down here some exemplary numbers. So the logarithm is then essentially the logarithm of what? Um, electron mass square, uh, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 4 GeV. And uh, the Z mass is around, how do you, uh, do you know what the Z mass is? Yeah. 91 GeV. So let's say approximately 100. Uh, GeV, and then you have here, uh, and that whole thing is squared, 
uh, 10 to the minus 4 divided by 10 to the 2 is approximately 10 to the minus 6 times 5 square and the log of this gives about minus 2.5. So this is this correction, minus 2.5. Um, and comparing this or multiplying this with that number, minus 2.5 times that, this is around 1% times 2.5, so we get a few percent correction of the effective interaction strength. So interactions uh, between charged particles um, at energy scales of the Z-boson mass, like we have at high energy colliders, is a few percent stronger than you would expect by classical electrodynamics. Few percent is a large effect for the precision that we have at particle physics experiments and therefore I write it is a large effect. What happens if minus q square is equal to the grand unification scale? Uh, do you know what the grand unification scale is of this hypothetical grand unification? Which is of course a theoretical idea where all the forces could become equal. That is around uh, 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 GeV square, so it's about 12 orders uh, or 14 orders of magnitude larger than the uh, energies we have in experiments, so it's currently not accessible by uh, experiments in particle physics. But anyway, then the logarithm would be, of course, accordingly larger. Then we would have here the electron mass divided by 10 to the 16 square, and that is around minus 80. So I did the calculation correctly, it's just approximate. So if you have here minus 80 and here around 1 over 100, you get an essentially 100% effect, a very large effect and uh, so very large effect. So and this shows you so the um, electromagnetic interaction gets 100% um, corrections, so, or it could also blow up. It, uh, the denominator could uh, conceivably even go to zero. So anyway, the denominator can become really small, and therefore we get very large corrections to the effective interaction strength. And that shows you that it's at least plausible that at this energy scale, the electromagnetic interaction becomes equally strong as the strong interaction. And that is exactly the point of grand unification. All forces could become equally strong at such energy scales. And this is how we know what uh, the grand unification scale should be if grand unification exists, then it should be an energy scale where the effective interaction strengths of all forces are approximately equal. And here we see that we can actually calculate the effective interaction strengths at different energies. And uh, in that way, we can obtain information on this hypothetical grand unification scale. Let me just give you also the full calculation. Full calculation including all fermions, not only the electron, but all leptons and also the quarks, which are also strongly interacting, then um, the effective alpha at the scale Q square is mz square is approximately 1 over 128. And so this is really a 6% effect. So that is the true result uh, if you do the exact computation or the best uh, determination which is currently feasible. Then you see that you really can define and you can then do a, a very precise 
definition of that without approximate equal signs, but with exact equality signs. Um, and you will see that this effective alpha has about this value, which is 6% bigger than the value determined in atomic physics experiments. Yes. Uh, because the ZMA scale is a very useful reference scale for electroweak scales, uh, you could just as well choose the W boson mass or the Higgs boson mass or the top quark mass or simply say 100 GeV as an energy scale. Um, but the set mass is uh, uh, the most precisely known numbers out of all the numbers I mentioned. Uh, therefore, if you choose any scale, then why not the set mass? but it's just a reference scale for a typical energy of the order of electroweak interactions. Right. Okay, so let's just finish by a few comments. As I already said, this logarithm of E over M enhancement is uh, typical for quantum field theory predictions at high energies. And uh, there is a physical observable relationship between the effective interaction strengths at low energies and the effective interaction strengths at high energies and quantum field theory predicts what that relationship will be and it is of course experimentally measurable and uh, in that way we can confirm this loop prediction of quantum field theory. confirms the loop predictions experimentally. And now the final remark is about an outlook to a very famous theoretical framework in quantum field theory, namely what you see here is that you can parameterize and absorb such important loop corrections in terms of effective interaction strengths. And that gives rise to the concept of running coupling constants. And uh, uh, then in terms of those running coupling constants, there exists a theory called renormalization group theory, where you can immediately predict the running, in other words, the energy dependence of such running couplings and therefore of the physical effective interaction strengths of uh, processes. So let's write that down. This can be absorbed by defining a different renormalization scheme. Namely, we can use, instead of this on-shell uh, renormalization scheme, we can use a scheme where we might uh, use a renormalized coupling, which is E effective at Q square, let's say, instead of uh, this E on-shell that we had so far. The point of choosing a renormalization scheme was always twofold. In, uh, we need to give a definition of the split of the bare coupling into a renormalized coupling and a renormalization constant. And how we shift around finite parts is up to us. And how we split it then affects the relationship between the renormalized coupling and observable quantities. For the on-shell scheme that we have chosen, the result was that the on-shell coupling agrees with the effective alpha measured in the Thomson limit. And now we can instead use a new scheme where the renormalized coupling agrees with the effective alpha at some momentum Q square. 
the very natural generalization of the whole thing, and then we have such a running coupling. In general, running couplings, and they are governed by the renormalization group. Because the difference between such a scheme and the on-shell scheme is that this is now kind of a family of schemes because for each value of Q-square you have a different renormalization scheme. So in some sense this is an infinite set of different renormalization schemes for depending on Q-square. And how the different E effectives uh, for the different Q-squares are related to each other, that is predicted by the renormalization group. So the renormalization group gives you a renormalization group equation which tells you something about the derivative of that with respect to Q-square. So you get a differential equation, you can solve the differential equation and then predict the running of the coupling as a function of Q-square. That is of course an outlook to quantum field theory two. But actually, um, I'm not completely sure whether we will do it because it's already completely on video. Namely, these are the videos, I think, video 19 uh, to maybe 18 to 20 from 2019 and 20. So it's uh, three videos on, on exactly that topic, which essentially covers it completely. Okay, this was my final remark. With this, let me thank you for your attention and uh, really the very nice active participation in all of this semester. I hope it was kind of interesting for you as well. Uh, we had now this introduction to quantum field theory with a strong emphasis on free field quantization for a spin different from zero and then with lots of applications and examples in quantum electrodynamics. And if you are interested, I will be happy to see you also in some of the uh, lectures and seminars next semester where we will take you to the next level if you want. Okay, so thanks a lot and then let's do the exercise.